All right, we're carrying on with the Gospel of Mark. Now last week we looked in, in, right when we ended in chapter 8, verses 22 to 26, where Jesus heals the blind man in Bethsaida. That's where he, you know, the only example of his healing someone in stages. And then in the next section, we have this very pivotal section in, in chapter 8, verses 27 to 30, where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. And you see in verse 27, from Bethsaida, where they were when that healing was done, Jesus and the disciples, they headed for the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And that's not to be confused with Caesarea Maritima, which is over on the Mediterranean coast and was the center of the Roman government uh, in, in their, their control of Palestine. This place is about 25 miles north of Bethsaida. And so Jesus and the disciples, they head for the villages around there. And in the first century, Caesarea Philippi, it was predominantly inhabited by Iterians and Phoenicians. There were very few Jewish residents and the city had a distinctly non-Jewish character. But he's on his way up there to these villages and on the way, we don't know where, but somewhere on the way to these villages around Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked who the people say that he is. And as in Mark chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, they report that some say John the Baptist, the spirit of John, was in some sense at work in Jesus. Others say he's Elijah. And as I've noted, Elijah was expected to return as a herald of the coming end. So some say that he's John the Baptist, some say that he's Elijah, others say he's uh, one of the prophets, meaning one of the prophets of long ago. And interestingly, no one is reported as, as claiming that he's the Messiah, that he's the Christ, and that really highlights Peter's confession that he's the Christ. And Jesus asked the disciples who they say he is. And Peter answers saying, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. And as Mark Strauss comments, he says, you are the Messiah, stresses Jesus' most fundamental identity as God's end-time agent of salvation. Although Jesus does not use the title for himself, probably because of its nationalistic and militaristic connotations, this does not mean it's not true. From Mark's perspective, the author of the gospel, Jesus is indeed the Messiah, as you see in 1.1, the promised Savior from the line of David who will accomplish God's end-time salvation and establish God's eternal kingdom in justice and righteousness. Yet Jesus will define this Messiahship on his own terms. And that's very important. See, what does it mean? when you confess that I am the Christ or the Messiah. Now in Matthew, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 7, Jesus declares that this was revealed to Peter by Jesus' Father in heaven. But that revelation from Jesus' Father to Peter, that revelation was given through Jesus' words and actions. That's how it was revealed to Peter. As Strauss said, it's revealed in Jesus proclaiming the kingdom, his healing the sick, casting out demons, feeding the multitudes, raising the dead. And as with the initial healing of the blind man at Bethsaida, you have this light has dawned on the disciples. They have this vision breakthrough where Peter confesses that you are the Messiah, but their concept of the Messiah, what that means, is still blurry, as will soon become evident. So they know he's the Messiah, but they're not quite on, on point yet with what does it mean to be the Messiah. They don't have a clear grasp of that. But as they continue on the journey, that concept of what does it mean, what is the content of your confession that I am the Christ, what is that? That concept increasingly comes into focus as the journey will continue. 
Now, Jesus strongly warns them not to tell anyone about him. We've seen this throughout where he's previously silenced demons. He's silenced people that he's healed and said, don't, you know, don't tell people. Well, now he's, he's doing it with the disciples. And as Strauss says, he says, finally, he now commands the disciples to keep his messiahship a secret until he has defined its true nature. See, this purpose becomes clear in the following verses as Jesus begins to define his suffering role as the Son of Man. You see, G Jesus doesn't want them coming out and having going off half-cocked and having this idea you're the Messiah and then having that be percolating through the society because they don't yet get it, what it means for him to be the Messiah. And then in chapter 8, verses 31 to 33, now with Peter's confession that Jesus is the Messiah, Jesus then begins teaching the disciples about the necessity of his rejection, his suffering, his death, and his rising again. See, this is the divine plan of redemption. This is the divine plan of redemption. And Scripture has predicted this. For example, in Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53. So Jesus begins teaching his disciples. He wants to sharpen and crystallize for them what is behind your understanding, your acknowledgement of me as the Messiah. Now the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, they represent the Jewish leadership. Okay, so you have the, the most influential lay leaders, that's these elders. You have the priests and you have the scribes who are the experts in the law. They were the Sanhedrin. That's who forms the Sanhedrin. And that's the Jewish high court that is going to condemn, condemn Jesus. And Jesus' statement, when he sits here and he says that he'll be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, these groups that make up the Sanhedrin. He's going to be rejected by them. And his statement that he will rise after three days. Well, that's sometimes taken by skeptics as being an, an error. Since Jesus is crucified on Friday, and he rises on Sunday morning, but as Strauss explains, he says, after three days reflects the Jewish custom of treating any part of a day as a full day, so that after three days is the same as, he says elsewhere, on the third day. And so that's just, a, that's just an objection people make who don't know enough. Okay, so there's no, he's talking about he's going to be raised on the third day. Now Jesus speaks plainly about this about his suffering and his rejection and his dying and his rising, he speaks plainly about it, which prompts Peter to rebuke him. This prompts Peter to rebuke him. Though Peter had just confessed, he just said that Jesus is the Messiah, that, that Jesus is the Messiah, his vision of the Messiah, his understanding of what that role entailed, that vision was still blurry. He no doubt was thinking of the Messiah as somebody who would reestablish the kingdom of Israel through military conquest, through the defeat of the Romans and their allies and expelling them and kicking them out. And then when Israel then is a military power, that will then bring in the consummated kingdom. It will be through militaristic effort and expulsion of the Romans. And Jesus, when he says this, you see this idea, the notion of a suffering Messiah simply doesn't compute. That's not in his mind of what's going to happen because that's not how he envisions the Messiah. The Messiah is a conqueror. The Messiah is not a sufferer. And so he doesn't understand this. And so when Jesus says that flatly, Peter's got the chutzpah. To rebuke the Lord. He, no, no, no. You don't know, you don't know what's, what's going on with that. So Jesus turns. Now, it, 
how you understand the word here, it, it can mean either he turns and looks at, or he turns and sees the other disciples. And then when he does that, he rebukes Peter. Now, if he's saying that he looks at them, well, then it probably is because they shared Peter's view and he's looking at them because his rebuke encompasses them. So if he's looking at them, now, if, if Mark is saying that he sees them, well, then he, he recognizes, when he sees them, he recognizes that they overheard Peter's remark and he rebukes Peter so they'll not be misled by Peter's mistaken view of the Messiah. So whether he looks at them, whether he sees them, hard to know. But those are the two options there. And then Jesus blasts Peter. He blasts Peter for denying that he, Jesus, needed to suffer and die. He blasts him for that. See, his death on the cross is the centerpiece of all redemption. The healing of the broken and sin-sick creation. His death on the cross is absolutely crucial, pivotal in that. And by suggesting it wasn't necessary, Peter unwittingly, with blurred vision, was opposing God's plan and inviting Jesus to shirk the cup of the cross. And you can see how subtle that, how that would be. Because that cross is a bear. And so you could see this voice coming up saying, no, you, no, 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 that's not right. You don't need to do that. You see, so he's really opposing God's plan, as I say, albeit unwittingly and with blurred vision. Jesus calls him Satan. You see, because he's saying what the enemy would say if the enemy knew what Jesus had revealed plainly to his disciples, that his death and resurrection were necessary in the fulfillment of God's plan. You see, given Satan's role in bringing about Jesus' crucifixion, as you see in Luke 22, 3, John 13, verse 2, 13, 27, I don't think Satan understood that the cross was, was God's victory. I don't think he understood that. He was outwitted. Not just overpowered. He was outwitted. He's the one who has Jesus crucified. And God takes that and goes... And just turns it into the ultimate victory. You see, and I think that's... so. He's saying to Peter that Peter is acting as the enemy, the adversary would, in saying those things to Jesus. And this call to get behind me, it seems to be a call to fall in line behind him. You see, to repent and get reoriented as a disciple... Joel Marcus, he describes this understanding, which he accepts. He describes it as, quote, as a command to Peter to resume the path of discipleship rather than trying to lead Jesus. You know, just look at Peter here. He's the disciple. Jesus is the master. And here's Peter. No, come on, man. You know, he, he, he's going to assume the role of the master teaching the disciple Jesus. No. Jesus tells him, look, you fall in line behind me. I am the leader. I am the master. You are the disciple. And so he lets him know that. And then Jesus teaches about the requirements of discipleship here in 834 through 91. He tells the crowd and his disciples that if anyone wants to follow behind him, as he just told Peter to get behind him. Meaning, if anyone wants to be a disciple of his, okay, anyone wants to be a disciple of his, he must do three things. He must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. So anybody wants to be his disciple, 
deny himself, take up his cross, and follow him. Now, denying oneself, okay, that means removing oneself from the throne of one's life. That phrase connects to me. I hope it communicates to you. When I say to take yourself off the throne of your life, meaning you no longer have the ultimate say in what you're doing, how you live, how you conduct yourself, where you go, how you talk. You've given that to somebody else. You take yourself off the throne of your life. Strauss says, it is to renounce your claim to yourself, desires, ambitions, personal goals, and to submit to Christ as his slave. It is a denial of autonomy and self-sufficiency. When you say yes to Jesus, when you become a disciple of Jesus, Jesus then takes your life in places you hadn't thought about. But you no longer look at your life as I am the one who runs it. My life is here in service of you. Everything, every part of it, my marriage, my work, everything is lived under Jesus as Lord. And so this idea of taking oneself off the throne of one's, uh, off the throne of one's life, and then to take up one's cross. You see, this was familiar to people in the first century because people were crucified you see, for us, it's just kind of a phrase. But when you said to somebody to take up your cross in the first century, they understood what you're talking about. It literally meant to begin a walk. Because who were crucified? The people who were crucified were outcast in the worst of society. You weren't some hero. You were somebody who was looked at as the absolute dreg. And so to take up your cross is to begin a walk of rejection, shame, and humiliation that ended in the excruciating death of crucifixion. So it's to go and carry because the person who was condemned would carry the cross beam to the place where they were executing people. He would pick it up and he would walk through people and through the crowd with everybody we would say hating on him because they looked at him as an enemy and somebody who's horrible and somebody who deserves this and so there was all this shame this humiliation this rejection that went with that walk and so this idea of taking up your cross this was understood now Jesus did that literally and he calls those who would be his disciples, he calls us to do it metaphorically. Now, how do you know it's metaphorical? Well, I know it's metaphorical. It's clear from the statement in Luke 9, 23, where one is to take up one's cross daily. Okay, so if we're talking literal, where I'm walking and I'm crucified, well, that's a one-shot deal. But the idea of doing it daily, you see, there is a, it's a metaphor. But what's he saying with it? See, what's he talking about it? We are to recognize and accept that the decision to become a disciple of Jesus, a decision to become a disciple of Jesus Christ is a decision to walk a path of rejection, shame, and humiliation in this Christ-hating world. A path that may well lead to oppression, violence, and even death. I mean, this is all over the New Testament. This is all over the New Testament what it means to say Jesus is Lord. What it means to take your life and say it is no longer mine it is yours, and I serve you as a slave. You just tell me, Lord, what I'm to do, how I'm to be. And I will do my best to live it out, because you are Lord. 
And in that world, you see throughout the New Testament what that meant. It's a decision of utmost gravity. You see, we, gotta, we kind of just want to bring people in, schmooze people in, and not let them confront how grave a decision this is. There's no decision more important. No decision more important. It's a decision of the utmost gravity that's not to be entered into lightly. You see, not to be entered into lightly, which is why Jesus in Luke 14, 27 to 33, he insists that one must count the cost before making the decision. Because you think, oh, no, you know, it, my life just goes on just the way it did. I just kind of add some friends. Well, that's not what it's about. You see, it's about a radical taking of your life and saying, I now live as a disciple of Jesus. And when you do that, this world is going to come after you. This world is going to say either you're a screwball, you're a, you're a bigot, you're this, you're that, and it's going to hate you and come at you. It may cost you. It may cost you your job. It may cost you all kinds of things. But that's what's involved. That's what's involved. Now, we have to tell people that. That this is what it means to come and to become a disciple of Jesus. Now, following him as a disciple, as one who follows behind him. That means imitating his example, this third thing. So, so this idea of, and follow me. It means imitating his example, where that's applicable and obeying and spreading his teaching. See, we are learners. That's what a disciple is. That's what disciple means. We are learners. And Jesus is the one from whom we learn. He is our master. And so we're just, so Jesus tells them, if you want to be my disciple, those three things. And a person has to be willing to do that. He says, because, for, person has to be willing to do that because whoever opts instead to preserve his physical life, to avoid the risk of martyrdom that is inherent in following Jesus, will lose the eternal resurrection life that would be his as a disciple. You see, that's serious. Because whoever loses his life, whoever said yes to following Jesus and consequently was martyred, will save his life. In that, he will have the eternal resurrection life that is the promise of the disciple. Now, that doesn't mean that one has to be a martyr to be saved. It means that one must be willing to be a martyr if that's necessary. Now you talk like this in this world, people say, you're crazy, you're a fanatic. That's Christianity. That's what it is. It's not a social club. It's serving the risen Lord. And yes, that's what he's saying. I'm worth your complete submission and surrender and obedience and love. I'm worth that. That's what it is. That's what he calls people to. Now the rhetorical questions that you get in verses 36 and 37, they reinforce verse 35. It's no real benefit to gain all that the world has to offer. And I know how the, I mean, the world makes it look. It's like, no, no, this man, you got fame, you're in Hollywood, people putting up microphones, they care about your opinion on everything, even though you're a clown and an entertainer. Uh, you know, it's all saying, the world has the real value. The world is really what's happening. But it's of no real benefit to gain absolutely everything that the world has to offer at the cost of forfeiting the eternal life that one would have as a disciple of Jesus. 
And once eternal life, once it's been forfeited, once a person dies in a lost state, there is no price that can be paid to obtain that life. It's not like you're going to say, well, here's what it is, you know. I'm dying and I got the biggest collection of cars and houses and bank accounts and all this stuff. I got it all. And so the way I think we're going to work it, I'm going to live the way I want to. I will reject the Lord Jesus. And when I die, we'll work something out. No, you won't. (laughs) You won't. When you die in a lost state, there's not going to be working anything out. And that's what Jesus is saying. The opportunity for salvation is gone. A person must be willing to become a disciple because for those who refuse to do so. Those, he says, who are ashamed of him and his words, they will miss the eternal life that he provides. When he returns to consummate, to finalize, the kingdom that he ushered in, that he inaugurated, when he returns in his Father's glory with the holy angels, he then will be ashamed of them. He'll be ashamed of them, meaning he will provide no blessing for them. They were ashamed of him. They rejected him. They said, no, no, I don't want to be one of those Jesus people. Do you know how that seems in our culture? Oh, they're the worst people in the world. I can embrace everybody. I don't care how perverted. I don't care what. But the one thing I can't embrace and tolerate and that I am allowed to hate on is a Christian. I can go after him hammer and tong. I can say everything about him. I can deny him this, deny him that. Those who are ashamed of Jesus. Jesus says, when I return, I'm going to be ashamed of you, meaning I will provide no benefit for you. I will provide no blessing for you. Then having spoken of his return to consummate the kingdom, coming in the glory with the angels, his returning in the glory with holy angels, he promises that some of those standing before him, that they will see the kingdom of God come in power before they die. Some of those standing there will see the kingdom of God come in power before they die. Now a popular understanding of this in churches of Christ is that Jesus was here referring to the events of Pentecost. Okay, I'm aware of that. I don't agree with it. Okay, so just don't grit your teeth at me. I'm going to tell you how I think, what I think is going on here with most commentators. I think he's referring to the upcoming transfiguration event in which he selects. He says, some of you standing here, he's going to select three of those standing there. Peter, James, and John, and he's going to give them a preview of the second coming on the mountain of transfiguration. Okay, let me develop that just a little bit for you. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all preface the transfiguration account with Jesus' prediction. There are some standing here who won't taste death till they see this kingdom of God. All three of them preface the transfiguration with with that prediction. And then they link the transfiguration to that prediction by specifying the length of time between the two. In Matthew and Mark, six days. Luke says about eight days. But you have some who are standing here and then after six days, after six days. You see, there is this temporal tie where he's... He's connecting the two that way. And that connection was recognized widely in the early church. Here's what Jerome Nere says about that in his commentary on 2 Peter and Jude. He says, in the early church, there was a widespread interpretation of the transfiguration as the fulfillment of a prophecy by Jesus that those standing here would not taste death until they saw the kingdom of God come in power. So, the early church saw it that way. They recognized this tie of six days, six days, about eight days, that it was linking these two things, and they understood it. Now, people sometimes, they stumble needlessly over the restriction of the prediction to only some. 
And they say, some standing here won't take it. He's not saying that it's going to come after all but a few have died. He's simply saying some are going to be chosen for a preview in their lives. Others won't have the benefit of that preview. And he does. He chooses three. He chooses Peter, James, and John. You see? So uh, only they'll receive that, and the others will die without having had that preview that was given. Now, the clincher for me on this, I see what's being said here. I see this connection already. I see that the early church looked at it that way, but the clincher for me years ago on this was what Peter says about the transfiguration in 2 Peter chapter 1, 16 to 18. Now, Peter there, he says that they didn't follow clever myths when they made known the powerful coming. Now, he says power and coming, but it's probably what's known as a hendiades, which you, the meaning is combined, so powerful coming, but either way. So he says that, look, he says that when they made known the power, they didn't follow clever myths when they made known the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the vast majority, the vast majority of scholars understand when he says about the powerful coming that he is talking about the second coming of Jesus. He's talking about the return of Jesus to consummate the kingdom of God. Now, why do they do that? Why do the vast majority of scholars believe that when he's saying this, he's talking about Christ's return? Well, they believe that because the word that Peter uses for coming, this word parousia, was in Christian circles of the first century. It was almost a technical term for the return of Jesus at the end. This word parousia was almost that. Indeed, Peter uses it that way in the same letter in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 4 and in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 12, he uses it there unambiguously as a reference to Christ's return. So it is a almost a technical term in Christian circles of the first century. And we know Peter is on board with that because he uses it that way in 3.4 and 3.12. Here's what Douglas Moose says about it. He says, the word coming. I put these up just so you know when I tell you these things, I'm not making them up. Okay, Douglas Moose says, the word coming is used throughout the New Testament as almost a technical term for Christ's return in glory. So much so that the underlying Greek word parousia has passed into our theological vocabulary. That's the word we use to refer to the Lord's return. We call it the parousia. Well, why do we do that? We do it because it was so regularly referred to that way by the New Testament writers. Thomas Schreiner says, in the New Testament, the word parousia becomes virtually a technical term for the arrival or future coming of Jesus Christ. And then he cites some of the supporting texts there. See, Christ's return, so first you have this idea that he uses parousia, which is this almost technical term for his return. In Christ's return, it's associated with power. You see that, for example, in Mark 13, 26, Matthew 24, 30, Luke 21, 27. So you have this combination here of power and coming, or powerful coming, and that simply reinforces the conclusion that he is, in fact, referring to Christ's return. Because that return is spoken of in conjunction with power, and he not only uses the technical term parousia, he combines it with power. So that is one of the things that leads the vast majority of scholars to understand what Peter is saying here. Now, so you have that Christ's return. Now, the, the, thirdly, you have the denial of the this, of this second coming. You know the letter of 2 Peter. What's the main theme in that letter? You've got false teachers who are what? They are denying that there will be a second coming. They're denying that the second coming, the false teachers, it's central to the letter. So it makes perfect sense that Peter is here defending that doctrine. He's saying, we didn't follow cleverly, unlike what you're saying, 
that it's a myth, that it's nonsense. No, no, no. We didn't follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the powerful and glorious return of Jesus. Okay? So those things lead the scholars to that conclusion. Now, in assuring his readers of the certainty of the apostolic claim that the Lord Christ is going to return in great power, which return will be an eschatological, an end-time climax that is marked by the final judgment and by the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, Peter confronts directly the claims of the false teachers. They're saying that's nonsense. That's hogwash. They denied that Christ was returning. You see in chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. And apparently they taught that, look, the contrary claim, this whole idea of a returning Jesus was nothing more than a fable or a myth that had been concocted as a tool for restraining the behavior, you see, under this threat of a final judgment. That's not true at all. And so Peter takes that head on. Peter denies that the message of Christ's glorious return was a cleverly concocted fairy tale. And he does so. This is what's important. He does so by asserting that he and some others, meaning James and John, they were eyewitnesses to Christ's majesty when they were with him on the mountain of transfiguration. Clearly they're with him on the mountain and that's when the voice happens. So he's referring to the, to the episode of the mountain of transfiguration. He's clearly saying that they personally experienced in the transfiguration event what they experienced there, that that somehow disproves the false teacher's claim that the second coming is hogwash. He's clearly saying that, look, it's not hogwash. We didn't follow a myth contrary to what they're saying because of what we experienced. Boy, that was fast. On the mountain, maybe for me, I don't know about for you, but on the mountain of transfiguration, okay? But how that experience disproves their denial of Christ's consummating return. How it works is a little less clear. Perhaps he's saying, look, with the benefit of hindsight, perhaps Peter's saying that in, in seeing in the transfiguration, in seeing their Christ's glory and his true identity, they saw one who was too great, too majestic, to leave unfinished business, too great to leave creation in its current continuing corruption, this current state of continuing corruption, and thus to, to leave it the, the way it is, you know, that somehow it's, you know, all, all broken. That we saw one there who's too great to do that, too great to leave creation as it is, and thus they saw one who necessarily would return powerfully to consummate the kingdom of God, return to fully cash out his victory by ushering in the eternal state, that state in which there'll be no sin, no suffering, no mourning, no crying, no pain. So in seeing his glory, they saw one who was too great to leave creation broken, that he would in fact come to strip out all that was contrary to that eternal vision. Maybe that's how it works. But that Peter's saying the second coming <clears throat> was foreshadowed in the transfiguration. That that's what Peter is saying. That is not at all odd. That is recognized by a large majority of commentators. Let me give you a few. These are some of the leading commentators on Second Peter. For example, Richard Balcom says, On the mountain of the transfiguration... Jesus was appointed to this task of subduing the rebellious world to divine rule, which he will exercise in the future when he comes in glory as the eschatological judge and ruler. The author is therefore pointing out to his readers that the transfiguration to which the apostles bore witness is a basis for the expectation of the parousia, of the return. 
Peter David says, 2 Peter says that the transfiguration was a view into the future of the coming exaltation of Jesus, a view of his second coming with power and glory. Thomas Schreiner says, Peter defended the truth of the coming of Christ in a surprising manner. He appealed to the eyewitness testimony of what occurred at the transfiguration. Apparently, he conceived of the transfiguration as a proleptic, a preview, a proleptic and prophetic indication of the glory and power of Christ that would be displayed at his future coming. Douglas Moo says, Peter, James, and John saw, not in a vision or a dream, but at a specific time and place in history, Jesus' parousia glory. And Peter wants us to believe that Christ will come again in glory because he did see this. Last one. Gene Green says, the particular tenet of the heretic's teaching that Peter counters has to do with the eschatological parousia of Christ. He presents the transfiguration with its revelation of Christ's kingship as the guarantee of that final event. So the early church saw it that way. Vast majority of modern scholars see it that way. I see it that way. I'm not the odd man out. Okay? I'm not the odd man out. I think that's the, I think that's the right understanding of it. What he's talking about here with what he does there. Now, we finally get... So then... We get in 9, 2 to 13, we then get the transfiguration event. Okay, he takes those three up there. After six days, he leads Peter, James, and John up a high mountain. He takes them up there where he's transformed. It's a passive. This is something done to him by God. He is transformed before them. And Mark mentions that his clothes became dazzling. Brilliantly white, whiter than anyone on earth could bleach them. And you see what he's saying there, right? In other words, this is a supernatural manifestation of his glory. This is something that was done to him. It's not something that anybody could do. And there you go. You're free. Thanks for coming. <laughs>